Shields up, Iron Breakers. We're on here coming at you with another edition of the Cons Cast. And in today's episode, we're going to be talking about Anthem. But unlike most of the other videos that I've done before, I'm not going to be honing in on a very specific topic and going deep into that. I'm going to be tackling multiple topics that I want to talk about Anthem now that I've gotten to play the open demo and that a lot of people have gotten to play the open demo. So that is definitely going to be one of the big things that we want to talk about. The other thing is going to be performance in Anthem because I got a couple of tips for uh, at least for PS4 Pro users out there. Um, we're going to be talking about the EA hatred that is going on uh, with the community. I mean, it has been going on for quite some time uh, because I want to bring a different perspective onto that. Uh, we'll be talking about that a little bit further into the video. We're going to be talking about the concept of demo builds, which I believe that a lot of people have uh, some kind of misconception about demos, and I would like to try and explain a couple of things here. Uh, we're going to be talking about that release chart, although not too much in depth because I've already made a whole video talking about that in the past. Uh, the diversity of activities in Anthem. We're going to be talking about the bullet sponginess, which seems to be a major complaint in the game. And we're going to be briefly talking about Endgame, which is something that I personally haven't gotten to experience, but a lot of the content creators out there that have experienced Endgame have come out to address. So anyway, let's begin. First things first, open demo. Was it the shit show that we were all expecting it to be, considering how the VIP demo went down? No, it really wasn't. I was incredibly surprised. For starters, they opened up the servers a little bit earlier than we expected, as you guys will probably know if you watched the live stream that I held uh, yesterday, in case you guys didn't watch it. I'll probably put a link somewhere in this video if I actually remind myself, because I seem to keep forgetting to put links in my videos. I'm really sorry about that, but I will put uh, a link to that particular live stream, or you can just look it up in the channel. And in that live stream, there's gameplay of every single javelin, and pretty much there's nine hours of almost uninterrupted gameplay. So that should give you an idea of how well the servers were running. From the moment that they put the servers up until the moment that I was like, dude, I need to go get some sleep, I was playing pretty much nonstop. Were there disconnects? I believe I got like, I don't know, four, maybe five disconnects from missions. And those weren't even like disconnects that like boot you to the main menu. They would just like place us uh, back at Fort Tarsus or sometimes we just got uh, booted into the end expedition screen. So not a big deal. I also had two game crashes uh, from bugs or whatever throughout the whole nine hours. So like think of it like this. Five disconnects and two crashes across nine hours in a demo build. Comparing with the previous live stream where I tried playing for 10 hours and out of those 10 hours, I probably got like three hours of actual gameplay in or something along those lines. It's probably more than that, but you guys get the idea. The VIP demo did not go well. It was pretty much a black eye in Anthem. And I have to say the open demo actually ran surprisingly well. Now it's got some issues as well. It's not perfect. I've had disconnects. Uh, particularly it seems that the PS4 experience seem, at least to me, feels a lot more stable than the PC experience. Uh, I've had more disconnects on the PC than I've had uh, on the PS4, so I don't know if there's like some specific issue with the PC servers. Like, it doesn't really make sense because I know that a lot of people have been saying, oh, the game is developed for consoles and consoles first and all of this stuff, but if you actually listen to all of the content creators out there that actually went uh, to events and stuff like that uh, through EA Game Changers. If you listen to their reports, everybody says that they've played on PCs. So basically all of the development builds, all of the latest builds of the game have been on PCs and as such, they should be better uh, optimized for PCs. Naturally, with the exception of the whole situation of keyboard and mouse, which we've already heard that has been uh, greatly improved in the final experience, but naturally that remains to be seen until we actually get our hands on the final product. But most people are playing it with controllers on PCs, I think, on a lot of these events. Some people even playing mouse and keyboard, whatever. But basically, what I'm getting at is that most people have been playing it on PCs on events, so it would make sense that the PC version would be better optimized. And a lot of the people saying, oh, but the console version is where they're putting all of their efforts. I'm not exactly sure that makes a whole lot of sense. 
But anyways, uh, that is where we're at right now. So the open demo running a lot better than the VIP demo actually put my mind at ease uh, about a lot of things. Now, guys, might remember the previous video that I did where I talked about my concerns for Anthem. One of the big concerns that I had was uh, the net code of Anthem, whatever you want to refer to it as, basically the interfacing between the actual game and the game servers. I thought that there were a lot of problems there. Well, with the open demo, I feel like there are not nearly as many problems as we had with the VIP demo. And on top of it, we already know that the final version of the game has a ton more bugs that have been sorted out beyond these demos. And I guess while we're on the topic of demos, I should tackle the, the, the subject of demo builds, which a lot of people don't really seem to understand. Because I've seen a lot of comments throughout the community of people saying like, oh man, if the final game is better, why can't they just make the demo better? Because when you're building a demo, you're actually essentially developing a different game than the game that you are working on. What does this mean? So they have a pipeline, they have a workflow of how they're implementing fixes, how they're putting content into something, and all of that workflow is designed to go into the final game. Whenever you want to do a demo, that means you want to selectively pick a section of your game and you want to build an isolated experience of that game, you have to create a separate pipeline in order to develop that because the game needs to be able to compile without necessarily loading all of the assets of the final product. So those are two different products that a team now has to work on. And I'm not saying this as like uh, some kind of hypotheses because I think that's how it works. I'm telling you this as a fact. You ask any developer in the business and they will tell you this is exactly how demos work. Whenever you have a demo that you have to actually work on a demo for a product, you need to have two separate pipelines. Is that an excuse for what happened with the VIP demo? Hell no. That should never be an excuse. The VIP demo was a complete shit show, and there's no excuse for it happen. I said in the previous video, I'll say it here again. But what I am saying is that it does make sense that most of their development efforts have been put in the final version of the game. And as such, a lot of the fixes that you are seeing that they are talking about being already made in the final version of the game, that's why those fixes are not in the demo. Because at this point, the final version is much different than the version that we are playing with the demo that doesn't have the balance fixes. It doesn't have all of the skills properly implemented even. There are some skills in the Interceptor that I've played in the VIP demo that clearly looked at like they weren't working properly because I would lock onto a target and I would cast the skill and my Interceptor would run in the opposite direction. Those are things that you have to expect from a demo of this nature, which is why I still think it doesn't make a lot of sense they called it a demo. They should have just called it a beta. They tried making it work as a demo and, you know, there were definitely problems that we've seen. But this is just to explain people, that's the reason why they're telling you, like, all of a lot of the stuff that we're reporting on is already fixed in the final version. And then people are like, why is it not fixed in this demo? Because it's not like they can take all of their development team that is currently working on the final build of the game and say, hey, why don't you guys stop working on the actual game that we're going to be releasing and work on fixing this demo? I'm incredibly surprised that they actually fixed the infinite loading screen bug that we had in the VIP demo because that seemed like that was a pretty big deal to go around and fix it and they've actually taken resources from the main team to go back into the demo and fix that aspect of the game and it like i said it was extremely surprising for me that the servers were able to handle the load because make no mistake the load that the servers handled on friday is a lot bigger than the load that they're going to handle when the game actually releases because on Friday, everyone and their mother can play the game for free. When the game actually releases, only people that actually played, the, the, that actually bought the game are going to be playing. And it's going to be much less load than the load that they had on Friday. And the fact that they were able to pull that off without the servers completely exploding. Like, let me tell you, you guys might be like, oh, but I wasn't able to play or this. Here's what I can tell you, right? I'm playing from Portugal. Right? It's a pretty small country, so it's not like we have a big ISP infrastructure or anything like that. As a matter of fact, I can tell you right now, most of our ISPs are complete garbage. But playing from Portugal, I was able to instantly connect to the servers, no problems whatsoever. I grouped up with someone that is in Germany, and then a couple of hours or minutes later, we grouped up with someone that is on the States. 
and we were able to keep that party going without significant issues or hiccups throughout the entirety of the open beta. We had a little bit of rubber banding at the very start of the live stream, you guys can see that, but after that rubber banding issue, pretty much throughout most of the experience, it was pretty seamless. So it's like, you're talking about someone that's in Bumsville, Portugal, teaming up with someone that's in Germany, and then teaming up with someone that's in the States, and being able to have a smooth experience during a demo where millions of people are hammering these servers down, trying to play this game. I was surprised. And in the few times that we got disconnected, there wasn't a queue, there wasn't nothing. We just restarted the game or something along those lines and got back in instantly. As a matter of fact, the first disconnect that I experienced, I was in the middle of the stronghold. We were fighting the final boss. I got disconnected. Actually, it wasn't even a disconnect. It was a crash. The game crashed. I was able to launch the game again, reconnect, be able to send back to that same session that we were playing in before the boss was actually killed and I finished that mission. I mean, I actually wasn't able to help out because we were locked out of the room where the boss was in. But, um, I mean, you know, the mission finished. We still got our rewards. We still got everything. Everything worked according to plan. Speaking of which, I've seen a lot of people saying that, oh, I've been playing for this amount of time and now the game crashed and I lost all of my rewards. I figured I should mention here that if you guys just launch into free play again, after that happens, right, you've been playing free play or you've been doing the stronghold and you've picked up a bunch of loot and then there was a disconnect or whatever. Just launch into free play or launch into the stronghold, whatever activity. But I mean, I would advise free play because you're leaving a stronghold midway is a pain in the ass. So launch into free play and then exit and that will take you to the re reward screen and you will get all of your experience, all of your items, all of the grind that you've been working on. You get all of that stuff. You don't lose any progress even in the demo. Now naturally, the progress that you make in the demo is not going to carry over to the final game. Thank God for that! Because that was a big issue that I personally had with Fallout 76, other than the fact that the game ended up being garbage, ultimately. But one of the biggest problems that I had was the fact that the stuff that you did in the betas carried over into the final game, which essentially means that the economy of that game has been complete garbage, and it's filled with bugs and all kinds of issues, and legitimate players are getting banned. Basically... You know, that kind of stuff I don't think is going to happen with Anthem because, like I said, the progress doesn't carry over. You're going to have to start fresh whenever you actually begin playing the proper game. And in my opinion, that is a good thing. So, that is my opinion of the open demo. It reinforced a lot of my faith into Anthem. I still have a lot of the concerns that I talked about, uh, particularly with the fact that the SWOTOR team is going to be the ones that are going to be handling the live service moving forward. I hope that team has evolved and that they're not going to be shafting players like they did with the SWOTOR experience. I know that a lot of people have a lot of comments on how I feel about SWOTOR. Look, we have different opinions. What I said happened, happened. You had to continue to pay the subscription and all of that stuff if you wanted to keep accessing all the services. But basically, that was a really poor way of making a free-to-play experience because you it's almost like the free-to-play experience that they did in SWOTOR was almost like spitting on the face of every free player until they decided to actually give them money. That's how it felt and that's why I'm concerned with that particular team taking the reins on the live service of Anthem, okay? But anyways, I don't want to get uh, too sidetracked with that particular thing. So the other thing that I want to address is the performance issues uh, because a lot of people were uh, saying during my live stream that the gameplay looked like it was a little bit choppy it was you know it wasn't like much more than 30 fps a lot of times it was actually lower than 30 fps and you know basically saying okay the performance is not very good and the thing here is i had super sampling on now i had tested super sampling with other titles before and i never really saw that big of a difference in terms of performance but Earlier today, I was like, hey, let's try let's try turning all of this stuff off just to see if it makes a difference. And the difference that it made is massive. If you have a PlayStation 4 Pro and you're experiencing uh, only 30 FPS and a lot of times lower than 30 FPS in the Anthem demo, go into your sound and screen options and turn off super sampling 
And I guarantee you, it makes a massive difference. I saw immediately improved frame rates, particularly if you happen to be doing the stronghold or the, the little mini dungeons that you can get into. Uh, during free, free play, the actual performance is still not amazing. It's a little bit better, but you can't really tell that much of a difference because it's loading a much bigger section of the world. But if you go into the separate little mini dungeons that you can get into the instance locations, uh, the frame rate there was much, much better. You're, you're talking about going up into the high 50s in some points. Uh, even during certain heavy action firefights, like you can, you can actually see the gameplay because now I'm actually recording with super sampling off. It makes a massive amount of difference. I also turned off boost mode. I'm not sure if that impacts it as well, but I've also had issues with boost mode in the past. So I'm just like, dude, I'm turning that stuff off like on a more permanent basis. Now, it is important to mention that this super sampling stuff only really matters if you're playing at 1080p. If you're playing at 4K, you're still going to be running into, you know, 30 FPS or lower on consoles. Now, having said that, I've seen a lot of people talk about how the game is not properly optimized for PC. And I've mentioned in the past, my PC is not very good. I have a 970, which is a really old GPU at this point. Uh, I do have a pretty good processor as well as I got 32 gigs of DDR4 RAM and I have all my games running on an SSD drive. So pretty much every, my, my GPU is my bottleneck. And at 1080p, it runs better than on my console. And the visuals look significantly better as well, particularly in the water. The water makes such a massive difference. If you see the way the water looks on PC, it is insane. So anyone that is really all about the visuals, I don't think that this game is going to disappoint. I've seen a lot of people screaming downgrade while I was live streaming. And I don't think that people understand that when you're watching a video, it will never convey, especially on YouTube, it will never convey the way that the game actually looks, particularly on a live stream. Like when you're talking about a live stream, in order for you to imagine what the quality of the person that is live streaming the game is even looking at, you have to imagine the game looking a hundred times better, a hundred times sharper, a hundred times more megabits, because that thing is being run at, at, at least in my case, in my live streams, it's running at 8,000 um, kbits, which it's eight megabits. It's not that much. It's just not that much bandwidth to actually relay visual detail, particularly in what happened in the live stream yesterday because of the fact that there were a lot of times where the there was like stormy weather. So you have a bunch of water particles on screen. And whenever there's rain in a video, that dramatically increases the artifacting and it changes the visuals that you guys are watching. Now look, I'm not here to defend EA's actions. As a matter of fact, I've criticized Anthem quite a bit on some of my earlier content. I'm here to have a balanced opinion, and I've already been called both a shill and a hate monger for this game, which is an interesting thing to see. A subsection of the community is basically saying, Rurikon, you're just a shill, you're in EA's pocket, and all of this other bullshit. And then a bunch of the other people are saying, Rurikon, you're just on the hate train, and on all of these other things. And could it possibly be that I just happen to have a balanced opinion and I can look at both the positives and the negatives of Anthem. Nah, that would make absolutely no sense. I'm either a shill or a hate monger. But ultimately, one of the things that I do want to talk about is the fact that a large section of the community wants to see this game fail. And when I'm talking about the community, I'm talking about the gaming community in general. A large section of the gaming community wants the game to fail because it is published by EA and it is developed by Bioware and there is a lot of bad blood between these two companies and the gaming community at large from Mass Effect Andromeda to the loot boxes in Battlefront 2 to even the loot boxes in FIFA and a bunch of more stuff that we can be talking about for hours on end. But here's where I'm at. I always look at each game as its own individual thing. Now, I know that that maybe is not the best way to look at it. You can't ignore the companies working on the game or all of that stuff. But to me, I look at a video game as a video game. And what I can tell you is that I like some things about Anthem. I also don't like some things about Anthem, and I've been very vocal about it, and we're gonna be talking about a couple more of them throughout this video, but before you instantly condemn Anthem just because it is being published by EA, I would urge you to take a look at what happened with Titanfall 2, 
which is developed by Respawn, and it is also a subsidiary of Ye, a studio that is owned by Ye, so it is published by Ye. And I think that Titanfall 2 actually suffered a lot from EA's marketing decisions, from EA's decision on when to release that game. I think that game suffered a lot. It was basically sandwiched in between other two FPS games that completely dwarfed the success of Titanfall 2. I even remember back when uh, those three games came out, I remember like, okay, so there's three first-person shooters that have come out, and of all the ones that I've played, I think that Titanfall 2 is the best one. And most of the people that play Titanfall 2 would agree. Most of the people that still play Titanfall 2 to this day, I don't know how successful the game is at this point, would even say that they were treated very fairly by the developers who consistently supported the game, brought out free DLC, kept the game going, and did not implement any kind of shady bullshit. You got the full game when you got Titanfall 2. You had the single, single player campaign. As far as I'm aware, from all of the articles that you can look up on Titanfall 2, nobody is saying that Titanfall 2 screwed over its consumer base. This is a game that was published by EA. So it's like, how about give some of the developers under the EA umbrella, at the very least, the benefit of the doubt, instead of just like, no, I hate it because EA. I mean, you're entitled to do that. You're entitled to your own opinion, and that's completely up to you, but at the same time, what about the people that are actually enjoying Anthem, of which there are quite a few? You're gonna just dump on them too? Is that how this works now? Instead of gamers standing together and being able to agree to disagree on certain topics, you all need to see my way or I hate you all? I mean, that's a pretty extremist point of view, and I personally do not partake in that point of view. I mean, I think everyone should be free to enjoy whatever video games they enjoy. It is important, however, to call out whenever there's shady business practices, which is why I have specifically talked about that release chart that has came out, that a lot of people are giving it a lot of flack now. But interestingly enough, when I brought that up a couple of weeks, maybe even months ago, People basically jumped on me calling me the negative Nelly and the hate monger and all of this other stuff. And then when I talked about aspects of Anthem that I liked, all of a sudden I was a shill for EA. See, that's the problem, is because people need to be able to see the good and you need to be able to see the bad. Now the release chart is definitely a problem and I completely agree that it is completely ridiculous that you need a goddamn spreadsheet in order to understand when you're gonna be able to play a video game that you purchased, not to mention that you're basically fragmenting your community and making it extremely frustrating for people that play on different platforms or people that cannot afford your deluxe editions or to pay for your subscription services. And it makes no sense because just imagine this, someone buys the game for PS4, pre-orders it even, which is something that you shouldn't do in today's culture because it just, you know, reinforces pre-order culture and that's bad because businesses tend to do more. Oh, you get this exclusive thing if you pre-order and all that stuff. So pre-ordering in, in general is just bad. But imagine this, someone pre-orders the game for PlayStation 4 and they're going to have to actually play it one week after everybody else on other platforms has been able to actually play the game. Like, how is that fair? Imagine that the, that person wants to engage with the community. It's like, well, he's gonna get spoiled. If he's looking for videos on YouTube, the story is gonna get spoiled for him. The content is gonna get spoiled for him. The boss tactics are gonna get spoiled for him. And yet, I see that a lot of people in my previous video are telling me like, oh, I have no problems with this. This is not a problem for me. And I, I just like, I have a problem with that. I'm not gonna hate the game because of that. I'm not gonna not play the game because of that. But I, you have to acknowledge that it is a problem for a lot of people. Like, basically leaving a section of your player base in the dark for a week? Like, that's ridiculous. Not to mention that then you also have that other subsection that I, I didn't even pay attention to earlier, which is, oh, if you're on Xbox and you have EA Access, which is a subscription service that you're paying for, you get to play the game, but only for 10 hours. And you're just like, what? You're just making it even worse. Or if you're on PC and you have like the basic version of the Origin Access thing, well, then you also get to play it, but only for 10 hours. And it's like, I understand that this is something that is a subscription that EA has, and all of that stuff, but the thing is that you gotta criticize about that particular service is that it shatters your community. It weakens your community because they cannot stand together. I'm not sure if that is your intention. If you want your community to not stand as one, 
but ultimately you are segregating your community into no these people are more important because they pay more money and therefore they can play the game earlier than these other peasants that are over here and the communities themselves will start warring amongst each other like you know that the people that do have e origin access premiere some of them will be elitist assholes and will come out and be like oh yeah i can play early i got this thing and it, it's like that just goes against everything that gaming is for me for me gaming is all about uniting and having a good time together it is all about getting away from the the strifes that we experience out there in the real world and just coming together for sheer enjoyment and just basically being a united community and what they've done with the release chart is deplorable it's ridiculous but anyway, uh, you guys already know my opinion on it. I did a whole video on it, and I don't want to stretch myself any further on that particular topic. So uh, one of the things that still remains um, with my concerns is definitely the activity diversity in Anthem. Now that I've gotten to play more of the game, I've played like nine hours straight yesterday. I've played a little bit more today. I've done some of the mini dungeons. I've done uh, the Stronghold a bunch of times. I've done some of the free play world events. Is that the activity diversity is still not there now i realize that when it comes to end game you're also going to have the legendary contracts and supposedly we'll also be talking about shaper storms which the developers themselves haven't really been talking about those a whole lot since they initially announced them in the um in the gameplay stuff although i am releasing this video today for all i know shaper storms could be talked about tomorrow in the demo so uh we'll see whether or not that is the case but basically the activities that we have right now don't necessarily uh run too far away from stuff that we've seen before this is a concern that i've explained in the previous video which is the whole thing about you know go to this place kill a bunch of dudes go to that place pick up the thing put it in the thing uh pick up this specific artifact take it somewhere and different varieties of that or hold this control point for for a little bit different varieties of, of that particular type of activity but basically that is most of the stuff that you're doing in free play now naturally the stronghold is more interesting but even the, the stronghold that we have access to the tyrant mine i mean it's essentially collect stuff twice and turn it in and then you have a control point situation no actually it's collect stuff three times you have three different objectives throughout that specific um stronghold which are basically grab a bunch of items and take them to a central location there, this happens three times throughout that stronghold those are like three major points and then finally after you complete that there is uh, another section which is like control this point for a certain amount of time and after you do that you go and you fight the boss and the boss is the most interesting thing of all in my opinion because it's a boss fight and it's cool um but ultimately i wish that there were more activities to actually do now uh, a lot of content creators have come out talking about uh, Endgame, they've, they've had access to the Grandmaster difficulty, and that appears to be much more challenging than the stuff that we experienced on Hard. Last night, as a matter of fact, running through with um, me and just two friends, we were just like having the easiest time going through any content that would show up to us on Hard. We would just like destroy stuff so fast that we wouldn't even have time to prime and, um, and detonate combos. Shit would just die too fast for that stuff to even happen. So, Hard Mode, if you have like a a decent squad with you is actually really really easy uh although i do feel that they nerfed it a little bit from the previous vip demo from my experience but i could be wrong i don't know for sure if that's the case or not i can tell you that this demo felt a lot easier than the previous demo but anyways in regards to the whole end game discussion what most people have been saying is that the end game is going to revolve around uh three main things that is going to be the strongholds and higher levels of difficulty uh, which are going to be very, very challenging from the gameplay that I've seen from some of the creators. Uh, then you're also going to be doing free play, which basically means doing world events, and the higher the difficulty that you do those in, the better the chances of getting better loot will be. And beyond that, you will also be able to do these legendary contract things, which seems like the most interesting, which are these quests that are generated dynamically, but they still seem to fall on that um on that set of activities that i talked about where you're picking up something taking it somewhere killing a bunch of enemies it just they jack up the difficulty and they have like uh quests which are chained contracts so basically you do one and then they're like okay now that we've done this we have to go do this other thing and you go do another one and you do this like three times i think 
and completing those will give you, you know, uh, rewards and stuff like that. Uh, you'll also be able to complement your gear through crafting, like I've mentioned in the past. Um, some content creators have also said that you will be able to craft masterwork items, which I thought was not a thing, but I guess maybe I'm wrong, or maybe they changed that along the way, I'm not sure. But basically, I do fear a little bit for the end game, which makes the whole Shaper Storms aspect of it that much more important. Because, like, sure, some people will love getting on that hamster wheel and just repeat these activities until they get the best loot that they can possibly get for their characters. But uh, I just hope we see some more variety in the stuff that they add. And, you know, this is a live service. Uh, they can't add more stuff, but ultimately you have to judge on the game based on what it releases with, not on the promises of what can come in the future. At least that's the way that I think about it. And finally, the last topic that I would like to tackle in regards to all the discussions that I've seen on Anthem is the enemies are too bullet spongy. And whenever someone has this argument, I, I legitimately wonder, so you're just going up with your gun against the enemies and like firing on them until they die? Is, is that why they're bullet spongy? Because with the demos that we've played, the only thing that we've had is the hard difficulty. And like I said, like me and two other friends, we were tearing through that shit like nothing. Like sometimes we would kill shit so fast, the only thing that actually takes a while to kill is the boss because he's got so much more health than anything else. And even then, I wouldn't necessarily say, oh, he's mega bullet spongy. I mean, compared to other games that I've played, like, if you're going to talk like that, well, I mean, well, Borderlands is bullet spongy as hell. Certain enemies in Warframe are bullet spongy as well. Uh, a lot of enemies in Destiny are definitely bullet spongy as hell. So, and if you go with that term, then pretty much every single looter shooter in existence has bullet spongy enemies. But the thing here is, I think that a lot of people are focusing too much on their weapons and they don't realize the ridiculous cooldowns that the abilities have in Anthem because Anthem is just a different playstyle. A lot of people keep comparing it to Warframe and Destiny and all these other looter shooters and I keep saying, the game plays nothing like those games. In my, from my experience, the game does not play like those games at all. The only thing this game has in common with Warframe is that your character has a suit of armor. And in Warframe, you have a Warframe. Your Tenno has a war Actually, you have multiple Warframes. Just like in this game, you have multiple Javelins. That's where it ends. The gameplay is very, very different. Like I said, if you want to compare this to anything, the closest you can get is Mass Effect gameplay. This is what the closest thing that you will be able to compare it to in, in terms of actual the way it feels to play this game. It's, it's Mass Effect. It feels like the combat gameplay of Mass Effect Andromeda. A little bit. Not even that much because you can fly around in here and just the simple fact that you can fly opens up so many more possibilities for the stuff that you can do. And the combo system and the different skills and the interaction between each of the different javelins and the, all the stuff that you can do. So it's like when you're complaining about bullet sponge enemies, I kind of feel like you're not aligned yourself with the weakness of those enemies so like if, if they have a yellow health gauge then basically you want to use fire and acid abilities because they will melt through that yellow health gauge if it has if he has a blue shield then you want to use lightning and frost abilities because it melts that shield and it really does it goes down so friggin fast if you just bother to actually use the proper abilities to do it and you guys are well but what if I'm playing solo? Well, if you're playing solo, it's going to take you a little bit longer to kill them. But this is a game that is very much designed to be played in multiplayer. And can you play solo? Sure. But if you're playing solo, you shouldn't be playing in the harder difficulties because those difficulties are clearly made with a group in mind. That's just the way it works. Can you play the game from beginning to end solo? Yes, you can. You should probably be playing in normal difficulty and you will most likely not suffer from the bullet sponginess problems that a lot of people are discussing. If you're going into the harder difficulties, you're gonna have to take a group. As a matter of fact, I can't wait to see these people go into Grandmaster from the leap in difficulty that I've been seeing from a lot of the content creators that have gotten to experience Grandmaster difficulty. They're not going to be able to, to pull through anything. You're not going to be able to kill anything if you go in, into it with that mentality. It's going to be impossible. If you don't optimize your group for a Grandmaster, you're not going to do anything. That's just the way it goes. The harder difficulty is going to require um, communication with a group. It is going to require team coordination. It is going to require setups all the way down to the loadouts. You're going to have to optimize your loadouts depending on the encounters that you will have, depending on your team composition, depending on the weapons that they have available to them and the gear that they have available to them. And that is something that I personally like. 
I like that level of optimization. That's why I always liked raiding World of Warcraft back in the day, because it required that level of team coordination. Now, that's not gonna be for everyone. And for those people, there's the lower difficulties and it will take you longer to actually get that gear if you wanna have the solo experience. You can still have it, but ultimately this is a multiplayer game. Anyways, these are just one man's thoughts and opinions. I'm, I kind of predict that in the comment section, I'll see a lot of people calling me a shill again because I'm being positive about several aspects despite the fact that I still criticize a lot of aspects on Anthem. You can't be seen as someone that has a balanced opinion. But either way, if you did enjoy the video, hit it up with a like. I cannot stress how much that helps out um, the channel and the video is actually getting discovered, uh, which helps me out a lot so that I can branch out more into Anthem and do more Anthem content. Either way, if you enjoy my content, subscribe, hit the bell notification icon, all that stuff. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Uh, I'm gonna go with eight. One for each of the tyrant's legs. Uh, no more scorpion talk, please.